Jealousy and madness are a lethal combination. When an 18-year-old girl lures her romantic rival away from their dorm room with promises of a fun night out, her victim hopes to God this is her chance to convince her nothing's going on with her boyfriend. But she doesn't live long enough to make her case. She has no idea how dark and twisted her killer is. In her mind's eye, she is a demon leopard, an apex predator with bloodlust and an obsession with the devil. For almost an hour, she tortures her prey until blood and bone are the only things left. But it's just the beginning. I'm Chris, thanks for watching True Crime Recaps. Krista Pike was just 18 years old when she was sentenced to death for the brutal murder of another teenager, Colleen Slemmer. Today, she's the only woman counting down her days on Tennessee's death row. Her story begins like many others, with a tough childhood. Krista was raised by her grandmother in Knoxville after her mother fell neck deep into drugs and booze. Her father was nowhere to be seen and we don't know much about where he is today. Sadly, Grandma passed away when Krista was still a kid and she fell back into her mother's waiting arms. Mama introduced her to drugs and Krista dropped out of school. She spent some time in juvie after getting picked up for petty crimes like shoplifting. According to her future lawyers, her downward spiral began before she was born when her mother decided to get good and drunk during pregnancy. Later in life, Mama Pike's romantic partner sexually abused young Krista, raping her at least twice. Krista discovered Knoxville Job Corps and decided to turn her life around. That or the state-sponsored classes and housing offered her an escape from the turmoil at home. Job Corps has a pretty good reputation. It's a place that gives teenagers a chance to learn vocational skills for free. They live in dorms on campus while they go to classes. Sometimes it's their only chance to turn their lives around. But in Knoxville, Tennessee in the 1990s, it was a darker place. Even the former mayor admitted it was known for all kinds of criminal behavior and vagrant issues. Then, in 1995, it was home to one of the most violent and brutal crimes in Tennessee history. Krista planned on becoming a nurse, but those plans came off the rails when she met and fell in love with Tadaryl Ship, a 17-year-old culinary student with a knack for devil worship. He dabbled in Satanism and gangs since he was a kid and considered himself an avid devil worshipper by the time he met Krista. But to his surprise, she loved Lucifer too. They'd chant, hold seances, and pray to whatever totems to Daryl had in his room. Krista called herself his Lil Devil. Satan and sex made them inseparable. Then, 19-year-old Colleen Slemmer entered the picture. Colleen was from Jacksonville, Florida, and although she didn't have a tough upbringing like to Daryl and Krista, she still enrolled at the Knoxville Job Corps around the same time. But when she met Colleen, Krista was convinced she had a thing for to Daryl and was trying to steal him. Of course, Colleen vehemently denied it, and so did everyone else who knew her. But it didn't matter how many people told Krista she was wrong. The jealous Satan worshiper had murder on her mind. But Krista put on a friendly face whenever Colleen was around. You know that face, that mean girl face that says, I hate your guts even though I'm complimenting your shoes? Under that fake smile, Krista wanted to kill her. On Thursday, January 12th, 1995, she put her plan into action, simply because she felt mean that day. To Daryl and another friend and co-devil worshipper, Shadala Peterson, were enlisted to help. Together, they came up with a fiendish plan. Around 10.15 p.m., another friend, Kim, watched Colleen walk off campus with Krista, to Daryl, and Shadala. Students had to sign in and out whenever they left the dorms, and all four signed their names before heading toward a nearby park. Krista had a box cutter and a miniature meat cleaver hidden in her pocket. Krista and Colleen walked into a Blockbuster music store to rent CDs before heading toward an abandoned steam mill on an isolated corner of the University of Tennessee campus. It was close enough to walk to, but deep enough into the woods so no one would hear Colleen's screams. Krista told her she hid a bag of weed in the trees and wanted to smoke with Colleen as a peace offering. But things took a heinous turn once they were out of sight. Colleen and Krista began fighting, just yelling back and forth at first, accusations and denials about Colleen and Sidaryl. But fists started to fly moments later. Then Krista drove her knee into Colleen's head, knocking her to the ground. 
The assault continued as Krista kicked her over and over again in the side and head. She jumped on top of her and slammed her head into the concrete path beneath them. Colleen pleaded, why are you doing this to me? And threatened to get Krista kicked out of the job corps. Her threats weren't enough to save her life. The attack led up and Colleen slowly climbed to her feet. She tried to run away, but Tadaryl ran after and tackled her like a linebacker. He pinned her down until she stopped struggling and dragged her back to Krista. The attack continued while Shadala kept lookout. Krista pulled out the meat cleaver and slashed Colleen's stomach. She began hearing voices telling her to finish the job or she'd be thrown in jail for the rest of her life for attempted murder. But the sight of Colleen's battered, squirming body froze her hand for a moment. She stared down and watched her bleed, giving Colleen just enough time to roll over, push herself up, and try running away. She hardly made it three steps. Krista slashed her across the back with the box cutter and she fell to the ground. Knowing threats wouldn't get her anywhere, Colleen began bargaining for her life. She said if the trio just let her go, she'd head straight back to Florida and never tell anyone. She promised she wouldn't even go back to the dorms to get her things. But her pleas were ignored. The only thing Krista had to say was, shut up, it's harder to hurt somebody when they're talking to you. The more Colleen talked, the more Krista kicked, slashed, and stabbed hundreds of times. Then, she tried shutting her up for good. She used the box cutter to cut her throat until she couldn't form words anymore, only low-pitched grunts and mumbles. By now, almost an hour of pain and terror had passed, but through it all, Colleen never stopped fighting for her life. She kept getting back up and trying to run away, and every time, Tadaryl tackled her back to the ground. On her final escape attempt, Krista picked up a loose piece of asphalt and threw it at the back of Colleen's head. The blow was enough to fracture her skull. She and Tadaryl grabbed one of Colleen's feet and dragged her behind some bushes, leaving her topless and dying. Krista used the chunk of asphalt to smash her skull four more times before calling it quits. Before they left, Krista and Tadaryl carved a five-pointed star, a pentagram, into Colleen's bare chest and forehead. But Krista wasn't leaving without a souvenir. She knelt next to Colleen's lifeless body, removed a piece of her fractured skull, and walked away. The trio signed back into the job corps dorms. Colleen's return signature was notably missing. Krista couldn't stop bragging about what she'd done that night. Minutes after her brutal assault on Colleen, she returned to Kim's room and bragged about the murder. She even showed off the piece of Colleen's skull, still covered in blood. She detailed the entire crime as she pranced around the room in circles. Kim just sat there, unsure whether to believe her or not. At breakfast in the morning, the morning of Friday the 13th, Kim asked what she did with the piece of Colleen's skull. Krista assured her it was safe in her pocket, saying, Yes, I'm eating breakfast with it. Later that morning, she made eerily similar comments to another classmate named Stephanie. She pointed down to the dark stains on her shoes and said, That ain't mud on my shoes, that's blood. She even showed Stephanie the piece of Colleen's skull. While Krista was busy flaunting her crime, a University of Tennessee groundskeeper was working near the old steam mill when he noticed blood on the ground. He followed the trail to Colleen's corpse, which was so mutilated he assumed it was a dead animal. But dead animals don't wear jeans and pink sweaters. He called police and 36 hours later, they had Krista, Tadaryl, and Shadala in custody. All they needed were the sign-out logs from the night Colleen went missing and Kim's eyewitness testimony. The trio spilled their guts from there. As the story goes, Krista and Tadaryl were both wearing pentagram necklaces when they were arrested. Krista waived her Miranda rights and confessed to Randy York, a now-retired investigator with the Knoxville Police Department. He said she was joyful giddy and smiling through the whole thing. She couldn't wait to tell them what she did. Meanwhile, Tadaryl went deeper into the devilish side of things. In the days prior, he mentioned to a fellow student named Kip that he had to make a human sacrifice because the celestial bodies were in alignment. He apparently had a Ouija board on him when he made this eerie statement. While police questioned their primary suspects, Dr. Sandra Elkins, the Knox County Medical Examiner, performed her autopsy on Colleen's body. 
Per standard procedure, Dr. Elkins began cataloging the wounds by assigning them letters of the alphabet. However, there were so many wounds on Colleen's body that Dr. Elkins said she'd have to stay in the morgue for three days to catalog the whole thing. Doing so would take her through the entire alphabet. Twice. As for the cause of death, Dr. Elkins called it blunt force trauma to the head from the chunk of asphalt Krista used to bash her skull in. Blood in Colleen's sinus cavity told Dr. Elkins that she was probably still alive when Krista delivered the final blow. The trial began in March 1996 with one paper comparing the courtroom scenes to those you'd see on TV. One of the more dramatized moments was when Murray Marks, an anthropologist with the University of Tennessee, took the stand with Colleen's fractured skull. Not a replica or a 3D model, the real thing. He also had the fragment Krista took as a souvenir and showed the jury how the piece fit perfectly, almost like a puzzle. Krista's trial wrapped up weeks later. Cameras rolled as the judge read her verdict, sentencing the then 20-year-old Krista to death by electrocution for first-degree murder. She set the execution date for January 12, 1997, the two-year anniversary of Colleen's death. A hysterical Krista begged for one final moment with her mother before being let out of the courtroom, but... The waterworks stopped shortly after when Krista penned an eye-opening letter to Tadaryl. In it, she wrote, Hey, love, I have ten months left to live. Imagine that. I'd spend every moment with you if I could. She then asked Tadaryl to change his statement to go along with hers. On Colleen, Krista wrote, You see what I get for trying to be nice to that hoe? I went ahead and bashed her brains out so she'd die quickly instead of letting her bleed to death, and they effing fry me. She signed the letter as Lil Devil and gave it to a guard assuming they'd mail it to Tadaryl. Instead, that letter ended up in the hands of the assistant district attorney. He read it aloud during her sentencing hearing and the courtroom sat in stunned silence and the judge gave Krista 25 years to life on top of her death penalty. Because the crime occurred when he was still a minor, Tadaryl escaped the death penalty and was sentenced to life in prison. He'll be eligible for parole in 2028. As for Shadala, she turned state's witness and pleaded guilty to a significantly lesser charge. Accessory after the fact. She got away with six years probation, though some are convinced she was more involved than she let on. While Tadaryl and Shadala faded into obscurity, Krista was still the killer leopard she'd always thought of herself as. And as usual, she didn't try to tame it. On August 24, 2001, a fire broke out in the maximum security wing at the Tennessee Prison for Women. Because of the fire, Krista found herself in a cell with two fellow murderers, Patricia Jones and Natasha Cornett. Apparently, there was some beef between Patricia and Natasha, and they began fighting in the cramped cell. Krista stepped in, but she wasn't trying to make peace. The scent of fear and fury excited her. She began strangling Patricia with her shoelace until she was almost dead. In 2002, against her attorney's advice, Krista asked the court to ignore her right to an appeal and speed up her execution. Perhaps Krista was just tired of sitting around and waiting to die. She mentioned how nobody was coming to take her to Disneyland. The court obliged and set an execution date for August 19th, 2002. She tearfully thanked the judge before turning to her mother, saying, It's okay, Mommy. But Krista changed her mind in July, and the court suspended her execution on August 2nd. In 2004, Krista was convicted of attempted first-degree murder regarding the shoelace incident and received an additional 25 years. Although, for someone on death row, it doesn't make much difference. Krista spent the next decade fighting to have her sentence commuted to life in prison. When all seemed lost, she concocted an escape plan with one of the guards, Justin Heflin, and a pen pal named Donald Kohut. Donald and Krista's relationship blossomed beyond casual letters, and he began making the 1,800-mile round-trip drive from New Jersey to Nashville to visit. Citing security concerns, the Nashville prison never released the official escape plan, though Donald was supposedly the mastermind and Justin was bribed to help. An unsealed indictment revealed the plan had something to do with replicating a key, but that was about it. But loose lips sink ships, and rumors about the escape plan foiled it before getting off the ground. Justin agreed to cooperate and only lost his job, while Donald got seven years in prison. Nobody could prove Krista's direct involvement and, thus, couldn't charge her with any crimes. 
As of 2022, Krista still sits as the only woman on death row in Tennessee. Even worse, the final piece of Colleen's skull, the one Krista took as a trophy, must remain in evidence until the case is officially closed, meaning until Krista herself is dead and gone. Colleen's mother, Mae Martinez, is begging Tennessee to either commute Krista's sentence or kill her. She only wants to put her daughter to rest once and for all, but needs the final puzzle piece back to do so. And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.